Okay, so I'm going to talk about the physics now behind the greenhouse effect. Um, again, you've heard about the greenhouse effect a lot. It's quite popular in uh, sort of common culture in the media. Most people don't really understand what the greenhouse effect is all about, but you're going to learn about it right now in terms of the physics and the chemistry behind it. And yes, this, this, this subject, this topic does actually deal quite a bit with chemistry, okay? Now I'm just going to come out and define what the greenhouse effect is is for you right away and then we'll talk about kind of the details of it in a little bit okay so the greenhouse effect is basically the warming of a planet when its atmosphere allows in ultraviolet radiation from the sun but traps the infrared radiation emitted by the planet and in the simplest sense you can think of infrared radiation as heat okay now the greenhouse effect is a natural process in all planets with atmospheres so for example or, or all bodies with atmospheres okay the greenhouse effect does not occur on the moon because there's no atmosphere. The greenhouse effect occurs on Mars, it occurs on, um, it occurs on Venus, and any other body with an atmosphere, okay? So, in the simplest sense graphically, okay, uh, you have incoming solar radiation from the sun. Um, it penetrates the atmosphere and gets to the surface, okay? It turns out that the atmosphere keeps the temperature of a planet in a, in a perfect, sort of a perfect balance over time, where it retains just enough of the, of the heat of the Earth that's re-radiated, uh, that bounces around in the atmosphere, it retains just enough of it to maintain the temperature of the planet in that just right sort of Goldilocks zone, okay? And what I mean by that is the zone to support life, okay? So if we tamper with, with the atmosphere's ability to retain that infrared radiation, we can really screw things up in terms of uh, long-term temperature changes and so forth, and that's what's happening right now in our, in our global climate, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, okay? Now, the term greenhouse effect comes from a greenhouse, and the purpose of a greenhouse is to keep things warm inside. It turns out that glass has a similar effect as a greenhouse gas in the atmosphere in terms of keeping in that infrared, being very effective at keeping in that infrared radiation. If you've ever walked in, inside of a greenhouse, even on a, on a day where it's cloudy, um, you, you know obviously it's a lot warmer inside of that greenhouse than it is outside. So it's a very, very effective way to keep things um, warm inside and that's why we grow things in them in the winter and in cold climates, okay? And I just want to point out um, the difference, the main difference between Venus and Earth. Now Venus and Earth are very similar planets, similar size, their, uh, their radii are similar, their orbital radii, okay? Venus is a hellish place. Its temperature, its surface has a temperature of about 460 degrees Celsius, Celsius on average, okay? Earth has a surface temperature of about 15 degrees Celsius. Now, the fact that Venus is closer to the sun, that difference in the, in the, in the orbital radius does not, would not account for this temperature difference, okay? The reason why Venus is such a hellishly hot place is because it's covered with clouds and it's got tons of CO2 and methane in its atmosphere. So planetary scientists um, have, are thinking that maybe in the past, Venus was similar to the Earth and something happened uh, to basically cause like a runaway greenhouse effect where the atmosphere became super saturated with what, what we call greenhouse gases and it's ba basically destroyed the planet. Um, anyway, kind of interesting. We don't know the answer to that for sure, but we do know that about Venus. And, and I should also point out that because of its high cloud content in the atmosphere, Venus has a very high albedo, which is part of the reason why Venus is so bright in the sky when you see it uh, in the evening or uh, in the morning, okay? Okay. Now, I want to talk about how light interacts with matter. We've talked about light in terms of uh, photon. We're going to talk about it in terms of a photon with energy, with quantized energy, equal to HF. In this discussion, we will not discuss... This is not a time to talk about quantum mechanics, the wave nature of light. We're going to talk about light as a particle, as a photon. Okay, now sunlight contains photons of many different wavelengths. And you know from our previous studies that photons interact with atoms. And what they do is they give energy to the atom by exciting one of the valence, or it doesn't have to be a valence electron, it can be any electron, into a higher energy level. And this only happens if the energy of the incoming photon equals the energy needed to excite the electron. And we talked about how uh, these energy levels are discrete, or what, what we call quantized. And of course, quantize, quantization uh, is what gives rise to the term quantum physics. Okay? Now, if this is the case, the photon disappears and the light is absorbed. But remember that excited atoms drop right back down at the original energy level, and when they do, they emit a photon. And this is what happens when light is scattered by the atmosphere. If the incoming energy is high enough, 
we absorb a photon can actually eject an electron, which is ionization, which is called ionization. Okay. Now, it turns out that the energy of molecules is also quantized. And I want to explain what I mean by a molecule. I know that you guys know this, especially if you're taking chemistry. But a molecule is several atoms held together. And you can think of molecules as being atoms, uh, like masses, representing the atoms held together by springs. So what they do is they actually oscillate. And there are resonant frequencies for different kinds of molecules, OK? Now, when the frequency of an incoming photon equals the natural frequency of oscillation of that molecule, the photon is very easily absorbed. And what happens is the molecule then gets more energy according to E equals HF, which is directly dependent upon the frequency of that incoming photon. It moves, it jiggles around more, and its temperature goes up very quickly because of resonance, okay? So this is simple harmonic motion, basically. We've already studied this as well. It turns out that the, that the frequencies that cause these oscillations are relatively low for molecules in the atmosphere. They're in the infrared part of the spectrum. That is crucially important towards understanding the greenhouse effect. It's so important, I'm going to say it again. It turns out that the frequencies that cause these oscillations in atmospheric molecules and the, chemi in the, in, in the actual molecules that exist in our atmosphere um, are relatively low, and they're in the infrared part of the spectrum. Okay? If that were not the case, if our atmosphere had a different uh, makeup, then we wouldn't be worrying so much about... Um, about the greenhouse effect. Okay, Now, solids, as you know, have lots of molecules of all different kinds. Now, the difference between this diagram and the one up here is all the, these, these blue spheres down here represent molecules in a solid that are held together by springs, but it's the same idea. that They jiggle around and they have, um, they have a natural frequency of oscillation, therefore resonance can occur inside of a solid as it does inside of a molecule. Okay, Now, solids can absorb many different wavelengths of light. By the way, solids have lots of molecules of all different kinds. They all interact, so energy levels are not necessarily discrete. It's easier for energy absorbed by the electrons to be passed on to other atoms in a solid, and therefore easier for the temperature to go up. When molecules get lots of energy, what they do is they oscillate more, and they give out more infrared radiation, which means that they're giving off heat. Okay, They're getting hotter. So again, if you think of a molecule as a mass spring system, simple harmonic motion takes place when atoms are disturbed from their equilibrium positions. Okay? Now every molecule has a natural frequency of oscillation. And remember that the, con the two conditions necessary for simple harmonic motion are as follows. Number one, the force or acceleration uh, is directed towards the equilibrium position at all times. And number two, the force or acceleration is proportional to the body's displacement from equilibrium. We've studied that like crazy. So if you can think of a molecule as, as a simple harmonic motion system, and you'll do some problems in your homework study packet treating molecules as a sort of mass spring systems. Now, remember that the frequency of oscillation for a mass spring system is given by this equation, where k is the spring constant and m is the uh, masses on the springs. Okay. Now, if we consider, for example, carbon monoxide, um, which is actually a greenhouse gas. Okay, you don't hear much about it because the amount of carbon monoxide in the atmosphere is, is fairly low, so it ends up not being a big deal. Um, that's not the case with, say, CO2 and methane, for example, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But if you consider carbon monoxide, uh, you can treat it as a spring system with a spring constant of 1900 newtons per square meter. Uh, or Sorry, newtons. That should be newtons per meter. Uh, and its mass is 1.14 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. You get a frequency of 6.5 times 10 to the 13 hertz. And it turns out that a typical infrared photon has an energy of 0.25 electron volts since E equals HF. That's in the ballpark of being the same as the frequency of os natural frequency of oscillation of a carbon monoxide molecule. Okay? So what happens is that this molecule effectively absorbs that photon and can resonate, and it heats up quite quickly. Okay? So uh, these couple of gifs down here, is sh this is showing you methane um, absorbing a photon and then jiggling and getting hotter and then emitting more photons. In, in the infrared part of the spectrum, that's why these are red. Uh, this is a CO2 molecule. So both of these are very, both of these kinds of molecules are very, can very readily uh, absorb uh, photons in the infrared part of the spectrum, and that's again crucially important for the greenhouse effect. Okay, so.
this is what happens in a microwave oven even, okay? So the oven basically bathes the food in electromagnetic radiation at microwave frequencies. It turns out that the natural frequency of most food molecules is about the same as this. So what happens is you have resonance within those molecules and the temperature goes up. Pretty smart that someone figured that out. Now, when atmospheric molecules readily absorb infrared photons, they heat up also. And this is kind of a mixture in this FET simulation, which we can play around in class, you can actually create your own atmosphere. It's pretty cool. Okay, so you have you have methane, carbon dioxide. It turns out water is a really effective greenhouse gas as well, um, vaporized water. Uh, and we'll talk about why why that is and how that affects it, and why you hear more about CO2 and methane. Okay, nitrogen, oxygen, all of these are um, are considered to be greenhouse gases because they tend to um, their resonant frequencies are around the infrared uh, in, the, in the infrared part of the spectrum. Okay, now this heating up produces more IR photons because the mass of air actually heats up. Okay, which does two things: number one, it warms the atmosphere; and number two, it produces more photons in the infrared part of the spectrum, which are absorbed by other atmospheric molecules. So it's basically a chain reaction, not unlike a nuclear chain reaction. Okay. All right, so the main greenhouse gases are as follows, okay? Uh, and they're basically it's categorized based by um, their percent contribution to the greenhouse effect on Earth. So we have water vapor, by far the biggest one, okay? Carbon dioxide, that's a big one. Methane, you see there are huge ranges for the amounts here. And then ozone to a lesser extent. And there are more than that, like carbon monoxide and so forth. But they're, they, they're, they're in uh, trace, trace um, rel relatively trace amounts in the atmosphere. Now, why do we hear so much about carbon dioxide uh, being such a big CO2, uh, a, a big uh, greenhouse effect, greenhouse gas, and destroying the atmosphere and all this kind of thing? Why not water? Well, it turns out that human activity doesn't really add any more water vapor to the atmosphere. The amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is, is fairly constant, okay? Um, because the next most prominent greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide and the burning of fossil fuels and a lot of other human um, industrial activities produce carbon dioxide. It's the carbon dioxide that is the big problem right now, okay? And to a lesser extent, methane, but CO2 is basically the big one, okay? So um, to make sure you understand my logic in terms of why carbon dioxide is the big worry and not water vapor, because that's important and that could come up on, a, on, a, on, a, on an IB exam, okay? Now, all of these molecules exist naturally in our atmosphere, and they have natural frequencies about equal to the frequency of infrared radiation. So when their amounts in the atmosphere increase, this becomes a big problem because the atmosphere's ability to retain infrared radiation naturally emitted by the Earth increases. Therefore, the temperature of our atmosphere increases, okay? Um, so here's a graph of the atmospheric carbon dioxide measured at Mauna Loa, Hawaii, on the big island of Hawaii. You can see, um, you maybe have seen these graphs before, there is no denying that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is at all-time record high levels and shows no signs of decreasing its rate of increase, okay? Um, so the big debate is what, what is what is causing that, okay? Is it is it human activity? Is it some sort of natural cycle? Uh, unfortunately, the, this, this, this whole topic has become a political one, um, but nevertheless, we do know this, that human activity, the burning of fossil fuels, for example, is creating is, is helping to create elevated and unnaturally high levels of greenhouse gases, in particular CO2. So the idea is even if it's a natural thing that we have these natural, um, you know, long-term fluctuations of carbon dioxide amounts, uh, the best thing we could be doing for our planet in any event, even if we're not causing that, is to, is to bring down our level of burning of fossil fuels. Because we know for a fact the science is there, it's not debatable. Burning fossil fuels creates more CO2 in the atmosphere, and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing exponentially. Okay, there's no doubt about those two. The issue is what's causing it and how to deal with it, of course. Okay, this is an amazing picture taken from the International Space Station, just showing you how thin and fragile our atmosphere really is. Okay, now solar radiation reaching the Earth is mainly in the visible spectrum. There are other amounts that's all over the spectrum, but it's mainly visible small amounts in ultraviolet and infrared. At the top of the atmosphere, it turns out that ozone, 
the purpose of ozone is to absorb UV and X-ray radiation. It protects us, okay? You may have heard about ozone, the ozone layer, and skin cancer and all that kind of thing. That's the connection there. In the lower atmosphere, it turns out that um, water vapor and CO2 are the main agents that absorb infrared radiation coming from the Earth and the rest of the atmosphere. So if 30% is reflected back to space, then 70% is absorbed by the atmosphere and surface, both of them warming. The surface of the Earth re-emits the incoming um, higher frequency radiation as infrared radiation, which is a relatively low uh, frequency, and it's absorbed by gases in the atmosphere and re-radiated at the surface. So it's all it's it's like one big mechanism where everything is influencing everything else, and it's like a very fragile. It's more fragile system than you think it might be. So. The infrared radiation, again, is strongly absorbed by these gases, okay, because of their resonant frequencies. Otherwise, they would be lost to space. If we didn't have any of these gases, the Earth's temperature would be, on average, 32 Kelvin less without it. It would be freezing. It would be horrible. So it's natural, and we need these gases. We just don't need to be increasing the amounts of them artificially, okay? So again, the enhanced greenhouse effect is the additional warming due to increased greenhouse gases and human activity. I'm going to put, to be politically correct, I feel like it is related to human activity, but to be politically correct, we sh I'm going to put a question mark there because we really don't know, okay, in terms of the science behind it, okay. Now, there are different, um, there are different natural mechanisms for, uh, for increasing greenhouse gases and decreasing them, and these are called sources and sinks, okay. So, for example, a CO2 sink is, uh, would be plants, vegetation. It turns out that CO2 is absorbed by plants in photosynthesis. It's also dissolved in the oceans naturally. Um, methane and nitrous oxide are destroyed in the atmosphere naturally by natural chemical processes, okay? And you should be generally aware of here are the greenhouse gases, here are natural sources of these greenhouse gases, and here are man-made or anthropogenic sources of these greenhouse gases, okay? Um, again, you just you don't need to memorize all this. You just need to be generally aware of where these greenhouse gases come from naturally and also unnaturally. Okay, now since the Industrial Revolution, which was the late 17, mid-1700s, the amount of greenhouse gases have increased steadily. We know that. There's no debate about that. And these greenhouse gases, it's mainly CO2 that has increased steadily, okay? So this is a great FET simulation, which we'll, which we'll play with in class, okay? So this GIF is showing you, it's simulating the atmospheric, uh, the greenhouse effect, basically, in 1750 before the Industrial Revolution or when it was just getting started. And you can see the relative... Uh, this is parts per million by volume, okay, so parts per million, okay, so mostly CO2, uh, methane, and nitrous oxide, okay. Now, if you go to today, all right, um, you can see how there are two things. You can see how the parts per million of all of these has increased significantly, okay, um, but look at the temperature of the earth, okay, the temperature of the Earth, all the, by increasing the amounts of these greenhouse gases by what seems to be a very small amount, right? It's only it's like a hundred parts per million, for example, for CO2. Effectively, what it does is it raises the temperature of the Earth by about one degree, one Kelvin or one degree Celsius. Okay, so it doesn't seem like much, but guess what? Over time, it's going to add up. All right. Now, clouds have a big effect as well. If you add clouds into the mix. Um, the, with today's levels, okay, these are today's levels being higher than they were before the Industrial Revolution, you see that the effect of clouds tends to lower the temperature on the planet, okay? Okay, so for comparison's sake, here's a couple of more. Here's a, a very minimal concentrations of greenhouse gases. So what I've done is I basically control the atmosphere in the simulation, and I've turned all the greenhouse gases way down. Look how cold the Earth is. On average, 260K. That would be really unpleasant to live here if that were the case. Now, very, very, very high concentrations. I've maxed out the scale, and you'll see what I mean when you play with the simulation. Look how high the temperature is. It's miserable, terrible. We shouldn't mess with it. We should keep it the way it is because that's what we like. That's what human beings have, have grown accustomed to are these temperatures, okay? Now, I alluded to uh, how um, a greenhouse, a glass greenhouse, is like the atmosphere, okay? You can also, in this simulation, play around with the effect of glass, okay? So one, even one pane of glass, look what it does to the temperature. 
okay? By the way, I should say that all of these starry looking things, these are photons, okay? The incoming photons are ultraviolet photons or visible, visible, visible light photons, and all the red ones are the infrared photons being re-emitted by the Earth, and in some cases being re-radiated -re back down. You see some of them are bouncing around in the atmosphere, okay? Look at the effect of one pane of glass. Wow, it's hot, unpleasant. Two, three panes of glass, miserable, right? That's why it's so hot. Um, that's why it's so hot inside of a greenhouse and so miserably hot, especially when the sun is shining. 